hopefully it is there we go. Um, <clears throat> after the public presentation and the question and answer session, so after about an hour, we ask that you leave Zoom so that the committee can meet with, in a closed session with Anthony. And I'll remind people to drop off at that time. Uh, if you have any questions for Anthony at any time, just write those in the chat box. And uh, at the end of his presentation, we'll select some questions for him to answer. Please remember to remain muted throughout the presentation. And the, uh, Anthony wanted me to mention that the presentation relies heavily on visual slides. So if you're on a phone, it's going to be difficult to follow along. So hopefully you can all uh, access the, um, the video here as well. Um, it's an indeed a true pleasure to introduce Anthony Siako. I have worked with Anthony in two courses and it became immediately apparent to me that he is an exceptionally gifted student. Indeed, Anthony received the okay, Master's we're about of- We're after, and it looks like we have most of our folks on the call today. Um, so if folks are okay with uh, me getting started or if there's anybody I should be waiting for. Uh, okay, I'm kind of continue on here. Sorry, I don't know what that was about. Um, Anthony received the Masters of Natural Resources Outstanding Student Award last year for his academic achievements, as well as contributions outside of the online classroom. Anthony is Muskogee, Creek and Seminole, and resides with his wife and four kids on the Navajo Nation. Anthony received his undergraduate in American Indian Studies from the University of Colorado at Boulder. He worked for 10 years in tribal conservation corps and contributed to natural resources work with various tribes before returning to school in 2020 at Oregon State University to complete a post-baccalaureate and master's certificate in wildlife management. He's now completing his master's in natural resources. Anthony is um, uh, currently an intern with the Bureau of Indian Affairs Pathways Program and received a prestigious fellowship with the Climate Adaptation Science Center. He plans to convert to a position within the Bureau of Indian Affairs following his graduation. I wanna thank Drs. Abby Lawson and Brian Miller who formed the team that helped guide Anthony in this capstone work. They have been truly outstanding committee members and, and really helped uh, Anthony and I've learned a lot from both of them. So I'm very much looking forward to hearing the results of uh, Anthony's capstone work. So Anthony, take it away with your talk about structured decision-making for tribal agricultural resource management plans. Alrighty, great. Well, thank you everyone who's able to join. Um, I look forward to this session. Um, this presentation is intended for tribal natural resource managers and decision makers, um, both within the BIA and tribes. I know we have uh, viewers from different backgrounds and hopefully you'll be able to follow along. Um, for those from the Climate Adaptation Science Center or anyone who's more interested in some of the technical details of the structured decision making and modeling, I will be giving another presentation at a later date that focuses more on that stuff that will be included here, but not in a lot of detail. So um, this is the presentation outline. The project focuses on agricultural resource management plans or ARMPs. And the focus is to apply a structured decision-making framework to produce a prototype of an SDM-based ARMP. This presentation is really just a brief overview of that prototype. Um, the document is rather lengthy. It's 100 pages, single-spaced, like dense scientific material. So this is really just a brief overview. And also to clarify, um, while I am an intern with the BIA, um, this presentation is not on behalf of the BIA in any way. This is exclusively in my role as an OSU student. So I want to open up by just showing a few of the conclusions um, from the project. Um, the Navajo Nation, in, in doing this research, it appears has a very rare opportunity to restore a lot of rangeland productivity. Um, that is the current moment that we're in right now. Um, structured decision-making can help raise the standards of ARMPs and IRMPs. Facilitating SDM, structured decision-making, is a valuable form of technical assistance that the BIA could potentially offer to tribes. And in doing this research, there's also some strong implications for the need for revisions to ARMA. 
So to begin, I want to give a little background on what ARMPs are. And to better understand ARMPs, it's helpful to see how they fit within ARMA and IRMPs. So ARMA is the American Indian Agricultural Resources Management Act passed in 1993. And it can be pretty well summarized with the following quote. The United States has a trust responsibility to protect, conserve, utilize, and manage Indian agricultural lands consistent with its fiduciary obligation and its unique relationship with Indian tribes. So essentially, AARMA is the main policy that lays out the role for the BIA in working with tribes to manage rangelands. Um, the official definition of an ARMP is stated in ARMA. There's no need to really read through the details, but in short, ARMPs are the management plans for tribal rangelands. They pertain primarily to agriculture and livestock, um, but may also pertain to wildlife, cultural resources, recreation, and more. Again, these have been um, required since 1993 and apply to all Indian lands that can be used for agricultural production. They are supposed to be developed within a three-year period and revised every 10 years. So a little on the context of the current status of ARMPs. Um, there is no publicly available archive that I'm aware of of ARMPs, although some tribes have made theirs available online. Um, it is apparent that many tribes don't have them that ought to, even though it is a federal mandate. And there is no direct federal funding for developing ARMPs. There are various pots of funding that can be used for many things that contribute to an ARMP, but the lack of direct funding was mentioned by several managers I spoke with as a big obstacle. And the Navajo Nation is currently developing their first ARMP. And that's significant not only for Navajo, but just at large as that will be the biggest ARMP in the country and could set um, a strong precedent for some of the standards of ARMPs moving forward. So the other thing I mentioned was IRMPs. And for those not familiar, that is an integrated resource management plan. The framework for IRMPs is also laid out in ARMA, but essentially your ARMP, your forest management plan, wildlife plan, all of those are intended to fit together amalgamate into an integrated resource management plan. My project focuses on developing a prototype specifically for rangeland management, um, but it functions for all of these and as a framework for IRMPs overall. So in short, ARMPs are the roadmap to the future of tribal rangeland. If you don't have a roadmap, it's hard to get anywhere in particular. Um, but as such, it is a big opportunity to really decide where we want to go and plan out step by step how we want to get there over the next 10 years. So that's a little context on ARMPs. So structured decision making. I want to explain what it is and how it fits within um, adaptive management. So as uh, many of you know, there is a field of science. Um, called decision science that has become more popular in recent decades involving the study of making decisions. It breaks down the decision-making process into pieces and then uses both qualitative and quantitative methods to analyze each piece in detail. Um, structured decision-making can be seen in contrast to heuristic decision-making. And that's essentially where the decision-maker looks at the situation and they kind of use their intuition and make a decision but exactly how they came to that decision, we don't really know. It's kind of a black box as to what's going on in their head. Heuristic decision-making is really um, insufficient for complex and high stakes decisions. Heuristics just means like a rule of thumb that simplifies the decision-making process. So for example, if we wanted to buy um, the highest quality product, we might just go with the most expensive one. Now, it's not a guarantee that that'll be the highest quality, but it's just a simple heuristic to make it quicker and easier. Um, so people who've studied this have identified common heuristics that, that humans use. Um, so one example is take the last heuristic. In that case, a manager might be trying to make a decision and say, you know, I'm not really sure what to do, so I'm just going to go with what the last manager did. 
And that might be a pretty safe bet, but it might not be the optimal decision. Um, heuristics can be a good thing. They enable us to make quick decisions, but they have known pitfalls. And oftentimes uh, litigation is um, the driving force that institutions feel the need to move towards structured decision-making. So within structured decision-making, there's various ways you can break down the decision process. Um, one of the most fundamental and probably the most common in natural resource management is this PROACT framework. There are five main steps. Um, problem is just identifying the problem or all the things involved in the decision context. Setting objectives, listing out our alternatives, which are just our different options, choices we have. Consequence modeling is saying, okay, if we go with this choice, what will actually happen? So we start predicting what will happen with a given alternative. And then trade-offs and optimization is where we look at those outcomes and then decide, given the trade-offs they're in, which one do we really want to go for? And again, this is, this is very fundamental. This can be applied to any type of decision. So it's used in a lot of different fields. A lot of SDM comes out of economics and business. It's used in social welfare, artificial intelligence, pretty much any field you can think of. And as you've all probably seen, a lot of different frameworks out there, um, like NRCS has a nine-step framework, for example, that's all different versions of these same five steps. So as I mentioned, SDM is being used more and more, um, including by federal agencies. Um, this is one graphic that just shows the use of SDM in related scientific fields. Um, the interesting thing to point out is that it really took off right after 1993 when AARMA was passed. So a lot has changed in natural resource management since that time. So some of the benefits, um, just briefly, um, the main one is you're likely to get more optimal decisions, and that's better outcomes for the resources you're managing. And that's partly enabled by the use of new tools, such as computer simulation modeling, things that weren't available 10 or more years ago. Um, also, the transparency of the decision process is really critical. Decisions are not made on facts alone. Science alone cannot tell you what the best decision is. It requires both information or facts and values about what we want. And in SDM, we try to transparently communicate whose values, what they are, how much they are, and include them in the decision process. Um, and that enables us to integrate other forms of knowledge because we're taking a systematic approach. Things like traditional ecological knowledge, climate change information, those kind of things can be um, integrated into that process very cleanly. Um, SDM, as it's done in contemporary management, <clears throat> is somewhat costly. It, it requires some um, experts in different fields, so it's not always worth the investment for every decision. Um, I won't have time to cover this in detail, but in the paper, I do discuss how traditional ecological knowledge and climate change were integrated to each step of the prototype. That could be a topic for another presentation. So as you all know, um, adaptive management is the guiding framework for Department of Interior um, Natural Resource Management. So I thought folks might ask, well, how does SDM fit with adaptive management? Um, basically, adaptive management is a form of SDM. So if adaptive management is done precisely and correctly, it's already doing SDM. But there's been a lot of research as to the challenges and pathologies of adaptive management. So the framework that I'm proposing is conducting the PROACT process in the decision-making phase of adaptive management that allows for the explicit uh, modeling of consequences and some of the other important components there. So it fits right in with adaptive management. Alrighty, so. That's an overview of ARMP's structured decision-making. Now we're gonna take a look at the prototype ARMP. And I'm gonna go step-by-step step through each of the components of the PROACT framework in the prototype. So in setting out, I looked at other existing ARMPs, the ones I was able to find. And it looks like typically they do have some form of problem definition. 
they all set objectives and list out their management alternatives. Um, but they generally did not have any form of consequence modeling or trade-off analysis. So in the prototype, I was able to compare these the first three components and then demonstrate what the uh, modeling and trade-offs might look like. So um, the other thing to mention is when you're going through SDM, it's typically conducted in real time with the managers, decision makers, stakeholders involved. Um, as a prototype, I just conducted this process myself. So this is just a simple example. Um, it certainly doesn't speak for um, Navajo Nation or BIA or anyone else. It's just kind of a template that people could see as an example of how to do it. So I did it on the case of the Navajo partition lands um, that is shown here in yellow. Um, NPL, for short, is basically an administratively distinct subunit of the Navajo Nation. So it's part of the Navajo Nation, but it's administratively unique. Um, the Navajo Nation is shown here in blue. Um, for those not familiar, uh, Navajo is um, over 17 million acres or 27,000 square miles. So it's a big area, um, bigger than the state of West Virginia. Um, Navajo Nation is currently beginning their first ARMP, which I didn't even know when I started this project, um, but NPL has already done their ARMP recently. So I was able to do this and compare it to the existing NPL ARMP. So again, in problem definition, we basically try to investigate everything relevant to this decision context, the time frame, the history, who's in charge, who are the stakeholders, et cetera. And given all of that information, we formulate a decision statement, which is what is the decision we're really trying to solve. Um, I'm not gonna go over the findings for each of those in this presentation, but one that I thought was interesting and maybe worth um, elaborating a little was on authority. Um, I've worked um, in the BIA in Navajo Nation around this kind of stuff for a long time. And I consistently hear different perceptions of the authority between the tribe and the federal government. So I came up with this um, diagram to try to lay out my understanding of the situation. So shown here at the top, we have the authority and how that flows down into planning processes and how that flows down into implementation. So the federal authority is based on trust responsibility or the trust doctrine. Um, arguably plenary power and some other things could play a role there too. Um, but that is vis-a-vis um, -vis tribal authority, which is inherent in tribal sovereignty, and that's negotiated through Indian treaties. The federal trust responsibility is primarily delegated to the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And that's encoded in those various policies, such as ARMA and the CFRs, which are the codes of federal regulations. And the tribe enacts tribal sovereignty and and negotiates with BIA in a government-to-government -government relationship. The ARMP um, can be developed by the BIA, but it does require concurrence from the tribe. In many cases, it's developed collaboratively or the tribe may actually take lead and develop it mostly themselves. And then the management plan as set forth in the ARMP can be um, implemented by the BIA as direct services or um, under the Self-Determination Act, it can be contracted or compacted to the tribe. And it's also important to remember, at least in theory, the tribe could also implement their own management activities with their own funding via their own sovereignty. So some of those questions that arise of why does the tribe have to get federal approvals um, when they're sovereign, it depends. Um, theoretically, if the tribe's doing type D management, then they shouldn't really need much for federal approvals um, in general. Um, but under type B and C, contract or compact, they're implementing the trust responsibility of the federal government, um, which was entrusted to the feds by the tribe. So essentially, the tribe is the trustor who has entrusted it to the feds, who has contracted it back to the tribe. So that's, that's why it gets confusing. But I hope this diagram can help lay that out. Also to mention in practice, a lot of the ways this actually takes place is kind of institutional knowledge. I'm not, uh, I haven't worked at any high level in, in this kind of institution. So um, others might look at this and say that there's some things that are incorrect or should be adjusted. 
but that's part of the goal of laying out uh, conceptual diagrams is that it invites that um, communication to improve our understanding. So to summarize um, some of the findings in the problem definition and the prototype, the trigger for this decision is that um, there's been a sharp decline in range productivity across the Navajo Nation, um, a lot of overstocking and a very high feral horse population. And there's also a significant current controversy over the reduced stocking rate um, down to 10 sheep units. So a lot of people uh, truly depend on their uh, livestock, it's a cultural way of life, and to have that reduced down to 10 sheep units has been a really dramatic thing. So that caused a lot of people pointing fingers saying, hey, why don't we do this instead? Why don't we do that? That's where hopefully this process can come in and find out, um, help resolve that, those questions. The authorities are Navajo Nation, the BIA, primarily um, type B, which is 638 contract, um, decision constraints, the NPL area, 10 year time frame, uh, funding. One of the big funding considerations is the recent addition of the Navajo Nation Agriculture Infrastructure Funds, or AIF for short, which is now totaling over 70 million. So again, this is a very unique moment in the history of Navajo rangelands to have that kind of a discretionary funding source available. So the way I frame the decision is, um, what is the most effective and efficient set of management alternatives to restore rangeland ecosystem services while minimizing impacts to land users and respecting stakeholder values. So getting on to objectives. So most any planning document already sets objectives. Um, SDM is uh, done this way is pretty much the same, except for we take it maybe a step further to classify the different types of objectives and then organize them in a hierarchical network and that helps us derive the most useful um, success criteria or measurable attributes of those objectives. So again, this would be done with the actual decision makers, but in lieu of that, I just surveyed existing policies. And it was pretty informative um, by looking at all of these different policies from ARMA to CFRs to the NEPA um, paperwork to um, different Navajo Nation policies, I found over a hundred explicit objectives stated for NPL. And as you can imagine, it's pretty hard to do 100 things at one time. So the process of organizing them was, was very critical. I organized the objectives into two main groups, management objectives and policy objectives. And each of those is put in this hierarchical network and that can help inform our alternatives to some degree. And then we'll eventually build a model when we model it, we'll be able to see how well it meets the success criteria of our objectives. So this next slide is a little chaotic at first. I heard in a good PowerPoint, you're never supposed to put more than six objects on a slide, but there's no way around it. Um, I'm just going to give a little overview of what this is. But again, I mentioned there's like 100 objectives at the outset. I clumped and reduced those. And then from there, we organize them in, in a hierarchy. So at the top, we have our authorities, the BIA and the Navajo Nation, and some of the stakeholder groups are shown as well. In red are their fundamental objectives. So the way I phrased it, the fundamental objective that I could perceive for the BIA is to fulfill fiduciary responsibility. Um, and that includes everything else that happens is all trying to achieve that fundamental objective. Same can be said for the Navajo Nation. Um, so below that, um, protecting range resources is a means to fulfilling those. Um, increasing drought resilience is a means to protecting range resources and so forth all the way down. So one of the benefits of this is rather than trying to measure how well we do in all of these different objectives, we can select somewhere high in the hierarchy and know that if we achieve that, we're achieving everything else. Now we can't really measure, it's difficult to get a finite measure on fulfilling fiduciary responsibility or even protecting range resources because it's so broad. So what I did was select these three as um, specific enough to measure yet encompassing most of the other clutter in this objective network. So those three are livestock production, 
wildlife diversity and drought resilience. It was just based on my survey of, of the policies. We can assign a direction to each of those and a relative weight. And again, this is where the subjective values of the decision makers come in. I just did a hypothetical uh, set here where we're saying that we care a lot about livestock production, not that much about wildlife diversity and quite a bit about drought resilience. <clears throat> so we're being explicit about our values there. And then we'll eventually try to measure how well we do in each of those. So the next step is listing alternatives. Um, these are basically just our options, the different management actions that we could possibly take. So similarly, I looked at uh, different policies and different sources of management alternatives. Um, there's a lot out there um, from research to climate adaptation plans and so forth. Um, looking, for example, at the NRCS field office technical guide, it lists 160 management alternatives for the state of Arizona. So again, it's hard to know which ones are best. That's, that's such a, a huge array of options there. So I tried to organize and clump them into groups. And I, I ended up with a list of management strategies, of just 12. I put them in different colors because the first one is a unique focus on feral horses. The blue ones all focus on livestock. And then the green ones are focused on the biogeophysical template. Basically the, the water resources, the soil, the plants, um, just impacting the actual template of the rangeland. These are three different focuses of all the management strategies. So the idea is we wanna decide which of these is actually best. So we're gonna plug them into a model and see how well they perform. Um, so to do that, um, because there's 12 and we wanna know which focus is best, um, I organize them into management portfolios. So that's based on the management capacity, the funding level, which either low which is like the current levels or the current with the AIF funds, which would be high capacity. And then the three different emphases. So in total, there's four portfolios, one for each emphasis, and then one that's the continuation of the status quo. So then we're gonna plug these four into the model and see how well they perform. So now we get into the fun stuff, the consequence modeling. Uh, generally just called modeling, maybe called consequence analysis or analyzing the effects of management alternatives. Um, but basically, if you don't do this step, you're, you're pretty much assuming that if we do this given action, say we lower the stocking rate, we're assuming that that'll allow palatable forage to grow back. But our assumptions are not always correct. It might depend the specific place you do that, how long you do it for. And without some quantitative values, it's hard to know how well that would work vis-a-vis -vis something else, like reducing the feral horse population. So rather than just make assumptions, we try to bring in empirical scientific evidence to see what will actually happen with the different options. Um, just in short, the reason we do this type of scientific modeling is you can think of the system as has different things involved, which we call the variables. And there's a lot of different variables involved. And humans can only hold about five variables in their head at one time, um, maybe seven if you're lucky, but it's, it's very limited. And we know in an organic system, like a, a large scale uh, ecosystem, there's really hundreds of variables. So it's hard to think about how a given decision is gonna impact the livestock, but also impact the wildlife and the land users and our budget and our management team and so on and so forth. So that's where we use these kind of tools to help map that out. The other thing we do mentally is we tend to think of the relationship between those variables in simplistic terms, like the more of this will mean more of that or more of this will mean less of that. And that's kind of like a simple linear uh, relationship, but really these kind of systems are defined by nonlinear dynamics with thresholds, feedback loops, and other things that we really have to look at in detail to better understand. So we can think of that as stocks and flows, states and transitions, um, things and the relationships between things. But in any case, we kind of have to map it out to, to gain a solid understanding. 
So we start by looking for empirical evidence. And um, in the scientific process, it's not like we just prove or don't prove things. It's more like we have weak evidence, um, medium evidence, strong evidence, or really good evidence. So at the bottom here is expert opinion. So for a lot of management decisions, there might not be studies that have been done in this landscape in this way to know exactly what the results will be. So we might ask people, you could even ask, for example, grazing officials who've spent you know, 50 years out there um, with their livestock, say, what do you think would happen if we did this? You know, so we can use expert opinion. There may be some studies on it. Ideally, there might be a meta-analysis that's looked at hundreds of studies and gives us some really high quality evidence but we draw from anywhere within here that we can find. So again, it's not separate than the knowledge of managers and experts. Um, it's really bringing it all together. So within rangeland ecology, um, one of the uh, most commonly used types of modeling is called a state in transition model. And these are neat, they're pretty fun to work with. Um, they simply look at a given area, so say you got your thousand acres of a certain area, and you look at the state of that ecosystem, which we usually describe by the vegetation. So it might be a sagebrush shrubland. And then we think, what are the other possible vegetation types that could happen here? We might know that it's possible for pinyon junipers to start growing and crowding and taking over. Or maybe um, cheatgrass could start coming in and taking over. I mean, we know there's a discrete number of possible states. It's not gonna turn to coconuts and bananas out here in the Southwest. So we list out those different states and then we start to list the ways that it might transition from one to the other. So this is a very simple STM. They identify two possible states and then it could transition via these arrows. Um, STMs are widely available. So it's not like we're doing this from scratch. Um, NRCS has STMs in their ecological site descriptions for the whole country. So here's another STM with pictures of the different states. And those transitions are labeled here. So fire could cause a transition, different insects can cause a transition, grazing management, and so forth. Brush removal. So you can see our, our restoration activities can actually cause these transitions between states. Some of those states might be more desirable or less desirable for the objectives that we have for our rangeland. So a big step in using these STMs was to figure out a way to represent them mathematically and then put them in a computer simulation. So this slide is from a presentation by Leonardo Frid on how to do exactly that. So for folks, if there are any on the call who are uh, rangeland managers and who have used STMs, if you haven't explored STSM, State and Transition Simulation Modeling, highly recommend it. Um, I will be posting the link to um, this video where the slide is pulled from, and it's not that challenging. So basically, you have your STM. So here is your, our landscape, and there's three different states that have been identified, deciduous forest, mixed wood, and coniferous. And the STM shows that a deciduous could transition to a mixed wood, or a coniferous has a few different transition pathways to a mixed wood or a deciduous. And those pathways are defined by fire, succession, or harvest. So for succession, for example, that would be just the passage of time. So just time alone might cause it to transition from this to that. But those transitions, we can assign probabilities. So they're quantified in terms of, there's actually a 0.23% chance of this transition occurring. So then we can, using a, the basic ways with a Markov chain, um, that's a type of mathematical equation that represents states in transition. So it's a natural fit for this type of model. And you can run that and sample it over time. Uh, Monte Carlo sampling, it's referred to. So we run that for 40 time steps. And then you can see that here's how this landscape ended up after, say, 40 years. So that's the basics of a state in transition simulation model. Um, there is a software program to help build and run these called STSIM. So that's what I used for this um, NPL context. So here's the NPL land base. Ideally, you'd wanna run the model for the entire land base, 
but as a prototype, I just picked one ecological system within NPL. So shown here in green is an ecological system called the Colorado Plateau Pinion Juniper Woodland. So that's one type of ecosystem. And within that, there's these five different states. And these definitions early all just refers to an early succession with all types of structures. Um, late closed would be late succession with a closed canopy. That's where the pinion junipers are basically touching and starting to crowd each other out. And then I added on to state areas. I'll explain more about that in a moment. So again, this may look confusing at first, but this is just the STM for that ecological system and NPL. So rather than showing a picture of the different states, this just lists some of the vegetation that uh, indicator species that you would find in a given state. And then all these um, chaotic looking arrows are the different possible transitions. In this case, I added the dotted ones are ones that I added to represent uh, management um, alternatives. And then I appended these two state classes. Um, that's not really ac accurate for representing this ecological system. Um, but the point of this prototype wasn't accuracy. It was more to show the dynamics of how these management alternatives could be modeled. So this allows us to model different alternatives such as invasive treatments and riparian restoration. So I ran that in the STSIM software program, and here's some examples of the results. So a given state class, this is the early all. So this is like, say, after a fire, the early successional stage, a lot of different um, grasses and maybe some weeds growing up in there, um, different all structures. The amount of area that's in that state class, so acreages shown here on the y-axis, we're starting out at about 17,000. Now, if we did the feral horse focus in our management after 10 years, so time on the x-axis, instead of having 17,000 acres of early all, we would expect to arrive at somewhere around 24,000 acres of early all. Versus if we did status quo management, we'd go from 17,000 down to more like um, 14,000. And then we can, looking at those acreages, we can say we know with that state class, it's um, might be very good for livestock production, might be good for wildlife diversity. So we can see that the different portfolios will have a different effect on our, how well we attain our objectives. So these are those same results um, for another state class, just shown in a different format. So not across time, but just looking at the acres that results from each of the four portfolios. So the late closed state class is um, in the pinion juniper woodland. That's where the pinion junipers or cedars, we often call them, have pretty much taken over and they're starting to shade out. So not a lot of grasses can grow in there, not a lot of shrubs. That, is, that means there's not a lot of palatable forage. So not great for livestock production. And that, that state is generally not great for wildlife diversity. Of course, there may be some species that love it, but probably not very many. So this shows under these portfolios with status quo, we'd end up with a lot of, uh, more area in that state class. <clears throat> and on the other hand, here's the riparian state class. As we all know, that's great for livestock production, great for wildlife diversity. We end up with a lot more riparian area under the biogeophysical um, focus. A very important feature in the STSIM program is that you can actually design and run this stuff spatially. So shown here is the initial conditions. So this is where on the NPL landscape the different states actually are. And in green and yellow are the more desirable state classes and the reds are the less desirable state classes. And then after 10 years, we can look at the different portfolios and see how it's changed. So under status quo, you can see a lot of that green and yellow transition to reds. Under the biogeophysical focus, we retain more of the green. And this is really just a very precursory prototype. Um, what's important about this, and it's not, uh, it takes a lot more detail to get into, but is that a lot of the dynamics of what's happening in the ecosystem 
um, vary spatially. So we, we refer to that as the fancy term as spatial autocorrelation or the distribution of spatial dynamics. Um, but essentially something like uh, the spread of an invasive species, we know it doesn't just happen randomly. It's more likely to happen near a roadside or near dwellings. And then when it does happen, it's likely to spread out from wherever it starts. So you can actually encode all of those types of spatial dynamics into your model and then run it in the system. And that's a very important feature of, of trying to get accurate results. All righty, so we have our STSIM model and the results are acreages of different state classes. From that, we can try to see how that use different ways of calculating how that impacts our objectives, if we did well or not well in our objectives. So for example, this is an equation to calculate diversity. So I use this equation to calculate, given the different areas and all the different state classes, how diverse was our landscape? Because we know that if we have a more diverse landscape, that'll at least loosely correlate with a higher wildlife diversity. We can also calculate the amount of pounds of palatable forage from the different state classes to find out our total palatable forage under the different portfolios. And then from palatable forage, we can derive animal unit months or livestock production. Um, the only thing is those are not exact correlations. So again, this is a little cluttered at first. If we had 15 minutes to talk about it, it would make total sense, <clears throat> but I'm gonna to try to do a quick job. Um, in short, so we have those state area out, outputs. We want to find out how well that uh, achieves our wildlife diversity, drought resilience, and livestock production. We can kind of calculate that, but there's other effects in those management portfolios that are important that might not cause a transition between states. So say we have you know, a million acres of sagebrush. If on the one hand, that's full of ponds, and on the other hand, it's not. Um, those differences would have a big impact on wildlife diversity, for example. So in order to account for those, I put it in a different, uh, another um, modeling framework called a Bayesian network. So what that does is um, I pulled out the mechanisms of the portfolio or the management options and looked at how those influenced our objectives in ways that was different than the state classes such as vegetative composition shift, water availability, and forest competition. And then factoring those in, I was able to tally wildlife habitat quality and overall forage availability. And then we can get a stronger sense of the outcomes in terms of wildlife diversity, drought resilience, and livestock production. So I'm going to do a little bit, uh, show the model or one of the models and how we can analyze trade-offs within that model. Um, so this is um, pulling up here, the actual BayesNet. Um, we usually call these uh, Bayesian networks or, um, but in this case, it's actually a Bayesian decision network because it has these utility nodes. So this is the same idea as before that uh, influence diagram. These are our management portfolios and how they affect water infrastructure. So one portfolio might have very little water infrastructure work. The other one might have a very high amount of water infrastructure work. And that the amount of water infrastructure will naturally impact the amount of water availability. It's not the only thing that'll impact that. Climate, these two different climate scenarios can impact that. Competition for those resources can impact water availability. And that can impact um, wildlife habitat quality and so forth. So flowing across this chart, you see how the impacts um, end up at our objectives. Then this, this uh, utility node says, how much do we value these, these different outcomes? And given that, it actually rates the, how well these different portfolios perform. So we can select one portfolio here like status quo and we can see what we're likely to get in terms of wildlife diversity, drought resilience, and sheep units. And in this case, sheep units is actually shown in, in real units. So these are 40,600 estimated sheep units. Versus if we go with uh, focusing on reducing the feral horse population, we could see maybe this many sheep units and this results for wildlife diversity and so forth. 
Now, the values of these management portfolios is taking into account how well they achieve these three and how much we care about those three. And then I also plugged in financial cost and social cost because those factors matter as well. So we're taking into account how much it costs to do these different portfolios and the social cost. So one like livestock production or livestock focus, say we really cut back on the stocking rates that might do really well in achieving these objectives, but we might know that that would be really difficult on our land users and have a big social cost. And again, I plugged in the values for these just hypothetically. So these results are not meant to be actual results. The idea is that the modeler would do this with the managers and decision makers. So they could say, and we could interview stakeholders um, and say that this, um, this one might be a very high social cost. Another one might be a low social cost. And we can factor all that in and get an overall value of our different management options. Another um, little thing that you can do with BayesNet that's really neat is we can actually backcast. So not only find out if we choose a different one, what's the outcome, we can actually look at, look, if I want this outcome, what do I have to do to get there? So if I want maximum wildlife diversity, what do I have to do in terms of wildlife habitat and in terms of diversity, in terms of water infrastructure? So we can look backwards in our network and see how to get to these different things. And we could also look in the middle and say, what if we just thought about maximizing water availability? How, what would that do for the rest of this whole system? So we can tinker around with it and uh, adjust the dials as they say. And that, that's where we start to see what the trade-offs are because a little change here might make a big change there. That's where we want to know to get to be most efficient. And then we can also see how, if we're in the context of an extreme drought, which portfolio works best in normal conditions might not be the same in an extreme drought. So we, we can look at all those things and play with them. And this is ideally co-produced with the managers. So they should, it's, it's a little, it's a lot to take in in five minutes. But if you take your time and understand it um, with a few hours, it, it's actually quite informative. So um, moving back to the slideshow, we're almost wrapping up here. Um, so these are the results I found. Um, in this case, it showed the biogeophysical focus to be by far the most valuable uh, management strategy. Um, personally, I actually don't think that's correct. I think if it was filled in with more empirical data, not just hypothetical values, I think we'd find the feral horse focus is probably the most uh, beneficial. But that's kind of the point of the model, which is rather than my opinion versus someone's opinion, just circularly debating, we can actually build a model and be confident that these are the results. So this is just hypothetical results for now. So some of the conclusions. I stated these four conclusions in the beginning, just to kind of go over each of those. Um, even living and working around Navajo for a long time now, it wasn't until getting into this research that I realized uh, the salience of this current moment in time. Um, you would generally say to, to impact that scale of a rangeland ecosystem, it would require tens of millions of dollars. You would probably have to redesign the management system, the grazing permitting system, and you'd need strong motivation by the BIA and Navajo Nation. That's a lot to ask. You don't just come upon tens of millions of dollars and all that stuff. <clears throat> But it just so happens that right now, it seems like all of those pieces are kind of falling into alignment with the AIF funds that, that is now available. The, the Navajo Nation is currently doing their first ARMP, which is like a fresh look at the whole management approach. The Rangeland Improvement Act has uh, looked to really kind of overhaul the permitting system. All that stuff is falling in line. So you might begin to see some of these kind of before and after transitions across the Navajo Nation in the next 10 to 20 years. At least this is a rare chance for that to possibly happen. Um, SDM, I believe, can help raise the standards of ARMPs by adding um, consequence modeling and trade-offs analysis, transparent inclusion of the values, integration of traditional ecological knowledge and climate change, and ultimately arriving at more optimal decisions. Um, this PROACT framework, I didn't realize it again until getting into this research, but seems like an ideal framework for integrated resource management plans. Because if you have one unified system, you can 
compare the objectives of your management, uh, wildlife management plan to your range plan to your forest plan. And they can all be linked to the objectives of your IRMP. So it, it allows for very clear linking and connecting of all the different resources involved. Just something to consider. Um, I'm not a policy specialist. I'm not a tribal attorney. Um, but it just appeared from, from my narrow perspective that AARMA might be due for some revision, namely that a, a ton has changed since 1993. Um, in this paper, I did a much more detailed analysis of comparing AARMA to the policies of other agencies. Um, and most of them do mention consequence modeling, um, but AARMA does not. So some things like that, um, just food for thought. And it also seems to me that the BIA might be able to play a role in facilitating the shift in the tribal natural resources. Um, the biggest one is direct funding for ARMPs, and that's a big topic issue. I don't work at that level. I don't know really what that entails, but obviously that would be awesome if possible. Um, but the other one is that um, the idea that the BIA could possibly have um, an ecologist series that there's ecologists in the BLM and NPS and USGS and these other agencies, if the BIA had ecologists, they could provide that technical assistance to walk a tribe through the SDM process in developing their ARMP or other planning documents. So those are just some of the ideas there. Um, to wrap up, um, I definitely wanna give acknowledgements. I had a ton of help from a ton of people and it was just critical to getting this stuff done. Um, so I got uh, fellowships and funding assistance from these organizations. My capstone committee worked with me every week for throughout this whole process. Several, several colleagues in the BIA helped me, giving me feedback and GIS help and everything. Um, experts in the modeling. Um, I'm not an expert, but these guys helped me along in, in very important steps. And others, uh, family and friends also helped a lot. So I just want to say Mado, thank you to everybody. Here are a few citations if anyone goes back and looks at the recording. Here is my contact information. Um, if anyone's interested, please feel free, free to reach out. I'm happy to chat. This was really a brief overview. I'm happy to go into detail on anything. So please just reach out. And to close out, um, this is just some eye candy of what's possible with restoration. If you look here, this is in Nevada. This is in a dry sagebrush area that was, you know, really overgrazed, you might say, um, but restored to some pretty magical stuff. So nice to look at. Um, lastly, I will be posting in the chat some links um, to check out on some of those other resources. Thank you all. Thank you, Anthony. That was uh, that was great. Can we um, kind of do a virtual hand clap for for Anthony here? Great work, Anthony. So we did have a few questions pop up. I'll ask them. We have a few minutes for questions. Um, let's see. Um, do the state class changes incorporate increasing aridity with climate change, Anthony? Oops, I think you might be muted. Sorry about that, talking to myself. Um, <laughs> Uh, yes, that information can definitely be integrated into a state and transition simulation model. And there's some great work that's been done on that already out there that I recommend checking out. Great, thank you. Another question came in. Can you speak about the data requirements for this type of modeling? One of your slides said, not always worth the cost or something like that. Can you say more about when it would be a good tool? Yeah. Um, that's a great, uh, that question is better fielded by experts who've done a lot of modeling on exactly these types of models. Um, but in general, the more quantity, better quality of data we have, the better model that can be produced. Um, but a lot of that legwork has already been done. So STMs are already developed for the entire country. And there's methods for how to improve them, how to integrate your, your veg plots and all that kind of data that's already out there can be integrated. So it's not like you're starting from scratch. And um, Bayes nets in particular are useful for situations where you don't have a lot of precise data. So you're using expert opinion just to get a general sense. That works really well with Bayes nets. 
Great. One more question I think we have time for, Anthony. Uh, how many different systems, uh, software systems, did you use, do you think, to perform the modeling and analysis? And then a follow-up, do you see training for, for and access to these tools being easily shared for tribal use? Yeah, so I just used two, the STSIM software program. And I got to get that link up. I'm having trouble posting it. Um, that software program and also the um, Netica program for doing the Bayesian decision, decision network. And there's a lot of trainings out there. Um, uh, they are available. I'm gonna be posting in the chat right now. And what I, I hope people can understand is that you don't be intimidated by those things. Um, they look intimidating, and they, but they're really not necessarily that challenging with, with a little bit of training. Um, so yeah. Okay, great. Uh, I think we'll take one more question here, Anthony. Um, by the way, you should skip, scroll through the chat when you review the, um, the presentation later. There are a lot of accolades here that just say excellent work. So I just want to share that with everyone. Um, person writes, I am a strong proponent of the geophysical restoration approach. However, I wonder if making more forage water will simply cause an increase in an in a an increase in horse populations. Is this being modeled? That's a surprisingly specific question because when I first developed the model, I did not account for that. And it, uh, the basically at first you wouldn't, it, but ST Sim does have a way in stocks and flows to account for exactly that effect. Because I realized that exact same thing when I ran it and it came out to such a good outcome to biogeophysical restoration. I was thinking obviously it would just feed back into an increase in the feral horse population and even more overstocking of livestock. Um, so the way I ran the model that was not accounted for because um, I didn't have the time and expertise to really do it, but it definitely can be. And if you wanted to make the model realistic, you would need to for sure. Great, thanks, Anthony. We're at about two minutes till the hour. So I think uh, we'll probably close it off there to give uh, Anthony and the committee a chance to take a brief break before we go into a closed session. I wanna thank Anthony for an excellent presentation, but I also wanna thank all of you who tuned in. I think we had uh, somewhere around 30 to 35 participants at one point. So uh, thanks all for, for joining us and uh, have a great day. And if you could all please uh, exit Zoom now, that would be great. And before we go, take yourself off mute, take yourself off mute if you would. And then and do a round of applause for Anthony. Thank you all. Um, also apologies, I posted those links in the chat and the hyperlinks did not come through. So uh, reach out if you have questions. I'm sorry that didn't work out. Okay, thanks everybody. Great job, Anthony, thank you. Thanks. Crystal, could we get you to exit Zoom, please? There we go. All right. Uh, Anthony, Abby, Brian, do you need to take a break for a few minutes before we get going? Yeah, I'm looking. How do we stop the recording function? Ah, uh, that's something that I can do down here. Thank you for that. Uh, let's see. Pause. Stop. I think that's it. Yes, I want to.